Well, welcome back to another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with is Dr. Mark Duchesne. So, Mark, can we uh, start out by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I am an associate professor of educational leadership at the University of Mississippi, where I work with uh, aspiring school administrators, uh, principals and superintendents, and we work on uh, master's, specialists, and EDD and doctoral, uh, PhD doctoral degrees. Uh, one of the things that I am really excited about uh, during this time is it's giving educators an opportunity to really try some things that we've always wanted to do and are uh, in a lot of ways being forced to do. So I think we're getting our, an opportunity to do a lot of baseline uh, data and experience based on you know the needs of our school systems. Okay. I am also, like you, a uh, research fellow with the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute. And I've been doing that since, oh, I think uh, 2016. And there I've been working with a lot of colleagues throughout the nation on how do we support students with disabilities in online learning environments. Uh, part of that has been doing a deep dive into some policy things. Uh, we were asked by the state stu superintendent of Michigan uh, to look at how students with disabilities were being both funded and how programs were dealing with compliance issues in online charter schools. Uh, part of that also, uh, they, Michigan Virtual allowed us to do a presentation at AERA and we just had a paper published through uh, the Journal of Special Education Leadership on that policy dive. Uh, I've been working in online education uh, before coming to Mississippi uh, at Central Michigan University for six years, where again, I was teaching uh, pre-service administrators. And every course that I taught at Central Michigan was online. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not new to this and I'm very used to and feel comfortable with online education. A colleague and I wrote a paper on how to utilize uh, strategies and online uh, tools for student engagement uh, that's out there. And uh, before that, I worked in um, situations as both an administrator and an educator where I was always uh, trying to push the envelope in online education. Back in the 90s, I received a grant from the Michigan Department of Education uh, to uh, get a classrooms of tomorrow computer and I did that because I opened up a bulletin board system with a phone line and the old modem so I've been doing online education since the middle of the 90s uh, I was getting ready for this uh, interview and I was looking back at my Vita and I did a presentation for my old school district and it was called um, uh, the internet a, a tool instructional tool that you're going to need to know about and uh, so, you know, online education has been happening for a long, long time. And I think we've just been forced into it in a way that had uh, COVID-19 not shown up, uh, we'd still be stumbling through it in a lot of ways. So, you know, it's a, it's a blessing in disguise in a lot of ways from my perspective. Very good. So thinking about, you know, those experiences and the, the, the both pre-service and in-service teachers that you work with now and back at Central Michigan, um, we've got a lot of folks that are out in the field now that, depending on where they're to, may have known about or had some understanding of online learning, but a lot that really it's just been something that they've read about and they've had no direct experience with, no direct training for. And um, many of them have been, depending on where they are, teaching now for two to four weeks in this remote environment, sort of stumbling through. Um, what's some advice that you would give to those folks now that they've had an initial taste of it, but still feel like they're sort of um, drinking from a fire hose at this point? Uh, the first thing I'd suggest to uh, educators is to stop and reflect upon what you've been doing for these past few weeks. Figure out what's been going well. Figure out what you still need help and support with. 
and figure out how that is impacting the content that you're putting forth to your students. I talk an awful lot when I'm uh, doing technology integration types of in-services or presentations that I really want educators to use technology intentionally. That includes online technology, the selection of the tools, uh, the resources of websites, um, the different audio, video uh, tools that you use, the assistive technology tools that you use. They're all there as tools to support your instruction. And I think a lot of people are getting really nervous and anxious because they are so, they're inundated with so many options as far as technology goes. And so not only are they concerned about the integrity of their content and the integrity of the information that they're asking the students to give from a curricular perspective, they're also having to learn a whole new instructional delivery method. And one of the things I would strongly encourage teachers to do is look at this from an instructional design perspective. Be very, very judicious about trying too many things at once. Figure out what you're comfortable with. Uh, don't stray too far from technologies that you're currently using in your programs or your schools. Make sure that the technologies that you're using are available to your students in their homes. Um, you don't have to use all of the bells and whistles and the biggest and brightest. It doesn't have to be shiny. It just has to be useful. And I think once people start getting uh, familiar with the technology and starting small, they can scale up rather quickly. But don't scale up too fast because if you are not able to give a good instructional reason why you're inter integrating certain technologies into your program, you're probably going to be using technology as a toy instead of a tool. Very good. Um, similarly, we've got a group of parents out there now, many of whom may have responsibilities at home in terms of the you know remote working or teleworking. Um, others are still as you know designated as essential workers, so they're still going back and forth to work. And and while parents are always a, a partner in the educational process, to be sure their role in that partnership is changing quite dramatically over the last few weeks. And um, I suspect at this stage, many of our parents are still struggling with what that role should be and, and, and how it should look and what they should be doing. Uh, again, based on the experiences you've had over these number of years, um, what sort of advice or guidance would you give to them in terms of how they can help their children as part of this new educational journey? Yeah, my background is in special ed. And because of my background, I'm a firm believer that structure and organization is very, very important for good learning to occur. And I think one of the things that I would strongly suggest to parents is to figure out a time when your son or daughter learns best during the day. Uh, when they're in classrooms, their day is pretty routinized. It's pretty scheduled. There are certain expectations that are, are, are asked of them at certain times. And we need to recognize and realize that children really not only thrive, but require those kinds of external supports. So I'd really strongly encourage parents to put together a, a learning schedule for the day and intersperse through that schedule times when they can get out away from screen time and do kid stuff, developmentally appropriate kid stuff, get them outside, uh, make sure that they're able to run and jump outside, you know, um, do things like uh, manipulatives and crafts. Don't make everything just 100% instructional or core content. Um, Figure out what your son or daughter is really interested in and utilize the school work as an opportunity to extend in areas where they may or may not have an opportunity to do such at, at school. I think one of the things that we're going to see through this whole sequestration and these educational opportunities that we've been having are, I think people are going to start looking at educational opportunities, less from a 
and I'm going to sound contradictory here, but I, I but I, at this point, I really think we, we need to understand this contradiction. Um, I think we're going to have to start looking at students from a learner design perspective, not just an instructional design perspective. When we say instructional design, we're looking a lot of times just at teacher behavior. What do you put in front of the student? How, what's your pacing? What's your scope and sequence? How do you assess and evaluate? What tools do you use? Things like that. But I think what technology, especially online technology, allows us to do is give students an opportunity to differentiate their output in a way that we might not have had during, uh, if we didn't have this uh, hiatus from traditional education. If your son or daughter is interested in a certain topic, uh, and you're stuck because you don't understand how best to teach what's being uh, given to you, look at the goals and objectives of the work that the teacher is asking you to do and contact that teacher and say, is there a way that we could still cover the content but do it in a, in a different format? I'm encouraging parents to become advocates for their children from a differentiated instruction, a differentiated output perspective because I think a lot of kids are also utilizing this opportunity to really do deeper dives into content that they've never had before either. So let's, let's use this as a trial period to do some really cool things. And during these trials, let's make sure that we're being very reflective and we're aware of what's occurring so that we can take some good data about time on task, um, frustration, uh, ability to meet goals and objectives, and then come back at the end of this for the next school year or whenever we move back to the more traditional setting and, and turn this data that we're all collecting into information. I believe we're going to start seeing a lot more people who are looking, going to be looking towards individualized learning plans for their sons or daughters because of this. I think you're going to see a lot of people who are going to start expecting maybe some summer activities uh, for their, their children so that we don't have the summer slide. Um, people say that the new normal is, is this. I don't think it is, but I think the new normal is pushing us into a situation where our old traditional is going to be different. Um, it's a different perspective, but I really think that we're, we're, we're going to have, a, um, there's going to be a, 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 an amalgamation, a confluence of the old and the new in a way that I don't think we're prepared to, uh, to deal with now. But if we are taking, like I said, good notes, taking good data, we can sit down as a team to talk about what new or different is going to look like when we come back into the uh, traditional learning settings. All right, perfect. Well, thank you very much, Mark. This has been another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with has been Dr. Mark Duchesne. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.